Hi, this is Misha, and today we're going to revisit some Italian handguns of the World War I period. On the table, we have a Model 1910 Glycenti. Then we have a Model 1915 Beretta. Or as some of you like me to say Beretta, I know you enjoy that. And then finally, we have a model 1923 Beretta. Now, what these all have in common is they fire the relatively short lived and really never used much outside of Italy 9x19 Glycenti cartridge. Now, we have an older video from about two years ago looking at a couple of these. But I wanted to revisit it just because it, we have better equipment now and also because they're enjoyable to talk about. This is an interesting story. Let's pick up this guy here. This is the 1889 so-called Bodio revolver. It fires a quite a large 10.4 millimeter cartridge. It was designed in 1989 and it was adopted in 19, excuse me, 1891 by the Italian military, mostly the army. And originally it fired black powder and is a very traditional single shot, excuse me, a double action, single action revolver. It's often credited to Carlo Bodium, who headed the design team that made this, but it's really a collection of ideas that were borrowed <laughs> as if they're going to be returned from other designs really it was a ripoff but they combined a lot of interesting ideas and patent laws weren't near as firm at the time in italy and later spain which will become relevant with this gun later in its life but i bring this out to show what was standard issue in italy at the end of the 19th century we have an iron frame gun this is the enlisted men's model with the slightly longer barrel. We do have a video featuring this gun along with, with and we have both the Type A and Type B in that video. So if you're interested in the Vodio, that video really covers it in detail. So double action, and as you see the trigger comes down, kind of unique, and single action, and folds back up. I don't like it, put anywhere on that. Typical gun, heavy, dependable, robust, and that's why Italy would continue to manufacture these throughout World War I, refurbishing them through the 20s and 30s, and even still issuing them into World War II. It was a dependable gun. This was really the backbone of the Italian military as far as pistols are concerned for both world wars. However, Italy soon wanted to replace it. Again, it was a somewhat modern design, not really by the 1880s standards, but as you see it, it's a loading gate. It's not a swing out cylinder. It f originally fired a large, heavy black powder cartridge. So it wasn't really that up to date. Better than the Reich's revolver, of course. And not quite as advanced as a Webley, one might argue, but that's neither here nor there. What happened next, and I know this is a poor example, guys, I apologize. In 1898, the Italian Navy purchased several thousand, ultimately about 6,000, broom handle Mausers from Mauser which would have been in Obendorf, Germany. Part of the, all that concern there, DWM. And they really wanted him to replace the Bodio. Now I said this is a poor example because this is a red nine and nine millimeter from World War I that was converted down to the, the, um, the Bolo standard post-war by the Germans. This was actually a police issue gun in World War II. But it, it's, the, it's the broom handle that I have, guys. They liked that it was an early and very reliable 
self-loading gun. It was chambered for 7.63, which was a bottleneck cartridge, which would later influence 7.62 Tokarev in Russia. We're still single action. We have a slide here. Hold open. We have a fixed magazine. 10 shots. These are topped off by stripper clips. Originally, they would have a five and a half inch barrel. This one's shortened to four. And originally, it would have had an adjustable sight. This one has the fixed. And these were issued commonly with shoulder stocks, which was a thing of the day. So the Italian military was interested in having a self-loading pistol at the end of the 19th century and coming into the 20th. However, they only acquired a few thousand. But this really got them thinking, and the army saw what they had, and it worked well. As time would go on, other nations would adopt other more advanced self-loaders, such as the Luger, eventually the 1911, so on and so forth. So what happened? The army expressed an interest in 1903 for having its own self-loading automatic sidearm. And a gentleman by the name of Reveille came up with a design. It was modeled in 1906 and was really based on an older design out of Switzerland, sometimes called the 1902. So the original design wasn't really Italian, but we have another Italian kind of borrowing the best ideas from a neighbor. There was some collaboration. And this ended up at the Glycenti factory. Now, originally, this gun designed by Reveille was chambered for 7.65 Luger, Parabellum, as it's more properly known. However, right around the same time in Germany, DWM was upscaling to 9x19 Parabellum, Luger, for more power. And Italy thought, well, we're adopting a gun, a locked breech, and it was going to fire the Par Parabellum cartridge. So let's upscale it too. And that's where 9 by 19 comes from. They essentially took this German design and they downgraded it by about 30% powder charge. Now we're, we're in the era of smokeless powder. There are very few black powder automatics. Black powder and automatics never got on well. And obviously they were pretty much coming of age with smokeless powder anyway. So 9x19 Glycenti evolved around 1906, 1907, is a lighter Luger. Now another gun I brought out that I thought it would be neat to compare this to, we're going to do the mechanics a bit, is uh, one of my favorites here. Oops, if I pick up the right one. The Japanese so-called Papa Nambu also sometimes called the 1902 modified or the type 4. These would be a, an improved version of the original 1902 in Japan known as the Grandpa Nambu and the improvements would start to be introduced in 1904 and would be complete at least before 1906. I bring it out to compare with this Glycenti because I think you can see a resemblance. To me, these guns were developed in tandem, independently for the most part. A lot of people attribute the Luger, and obviously it would have had some influence because it did predate these, but not by much. The first commercially available Lugers came out in 1899, 1900, and the first military adoption wasn't until 1901. So not a lot of time for information, especially designs, to get all the way to Japan. Although, obviously, Italy would have had more influence. I bring it out, though, because these guns have, to me, a great deal in common. We have a very spindly barrel. These are both recoil locked breech guns. This uses 
a single locking wedge with a single guide spring in the side. The Reverly, or later just Glycinti design, has a shorter barrel, but still just out there. This also has a single locking point. Although the springs arrangement and everything is quite different. This also has a fixed rear sight, whereas the Nambu has a adjustable. That's because the early on the Nambus were going to have shoulder stocks and that was deleted from the design. This has a similar trigger with a grip safety. I'm going to point it at you. Perfectly safety checked, guys. In fact, I don't even have any 9 Glycenti. We have a grip safety here. Which is extremely similar to the grip safety on this one. See, it comes up behind. So very, very much the same style of trigger and safety. Even a kind of a similar shape to the trigger guard and trigger. The grip panels are both made of wood, although some Glycentes would have synthetic trigger, uh, excuse me, uh, synthetic grips. Both use similar detachable magazines. And both are rear cocking with a slide or bolt hold back trilling. Doot. Although the Glycenti has an actual bolt hold open device to keep it up with the mag out. Yeah. Whereas the Nambu, once you pull your mag out, I need three hands to do this. I'm just going to push it down. Let's it go forward. It's a different system there. And the mags are different. Although they do have kind of that steep angle like a Luger. Scared me for a minute when that hit my hand. <laughs> the little lanyard flew down. It's like, oh crap. I don't dry fire these often at all, but there's no other way to decock them. And I hate to leave the, stream, uh, the stress on the striker on those. So I just think it's interesting. They're different guns for sure. But they are designed around the same time with the Nambu having a bit of an edge. And even the calibers, this fires 8x22 Nambu. This fires 9x19 Glycenti. They're both relatively weak by today's standards, although by the standards of the early 20th century, when most automatics were in 25, 32, 380, they were still a little more powerful, although not as powerful as 45 ACP or even 9x19 Luger, of course. I just thought I'd bring the Nambu out, but it was interesting. This gun comes apart in a very unique way as well. You do it. You have a screw in the front. You press down a small spring-loaded tab to unscrew your screw. Doot, doot, doot. And that lifts off. It's just a side plate, guys, kind of like on a revolver. And now you can see the internal workings. As I said, this has a single locking point on one side. I have one guide rail on the right. The left really does nothing to support the gun. Interestingly, this grip comes right off. See here. And of interesting too. See there? We even store a takedown tool in the grip. Which is kind of neat. For further disassembly. So that's a general field strip of this gun. It is technically a locked breech, although not terribly strong. And the Italian military 
would test these out 1908 into 1909 and the final model firing 9 millimeter would be the 1909 and it would be adopted in Italian military service in 1910 although it would be in production in 1909 Now one thing I did get wrong on my first video, I said there was no other safety. That was incorrect. There is also this back here, like that, which works as a safety. In conjunction with the grip safety. So it's an interesting design. It's time for a cat to make an appearance, isn't it, guys? This would be adopted by the Italian military and go into production. Now, it would not go into production at Glycenti. The design would be sold over to the Brescia factory, which had made most of the Bodios up to this point as well. And they would begin to produce these before World War I. However, as often happened in that war, they did not have enough in 1914, and then Italy joined in 1915 officially. So they often went back to the tried and true Bodio, even having companies in Spain manufacture it for them. Okay, single action. They would continue making the 1910 Glycenti, but whereas it was supposed to be standard issue, it and it was officially on paper, it was supplemented by large numbers of Bodios, either new production or refurbished older production. It's an interesting gun for being a unique design, but it's firing a not great power cartridge, and even then, these did not manage to be strong. I mean, you only have one guide rail for the bolt, one locking tab. They were not very durable guns. Holding it, it's not heavy. It's actually quite small with about a three and a quarter inch barrel. Excuse me, three and three quarters inch barrel. We have a seven round capacity magazine. It almost feels like it's made out of alloy. It's made out of steel, but it's just, it's a very svelte, thin, light gun. Although it's kind of an odd shape with lots of protrusions and, and odd located mag release. Although you'll see this on a lot of later Italian guns as well. Oh, we have a lanyard attachment in the back. It's not a traditional loop, it's an inlet. They would produce about 100,000 of these, as best estimates go. I've seen 50,000, I've seen 150,000. We'll just go in the middle. That seems to be kind of consistent with how common these are. These aren't super rare, but a lot of them did not survive World War I. It seems like production would end Shortly after the end of the war, around 1920, it seems like they were putting the last brand new guns together from parts, and they would keep refurbishing these up through the 30s. Some people report manufacturing up until 1925 or even 1930. I believe these are actually refurbishment dates. I don't believe they were making all new pistols then. If they were building pistols, it was from leftover parts, most likely. That said, after Mussolini took power, he wanted to have Italy as a major military power. So he built the army up and he needed all the handguns he could get. So Glycentes, along with Bodios, would stay in service through World War II. So many of these were used in both World Wars and that's why not a, just a huge number survived today, considering it's just not a super strong gun. These will chamber 9mm Luger. They will even fire it. A couple of times but if you try to shoot more than a mag through it even a mag was is not at all advised don't shoot nine millimeter luger out of these ever because you will destroy a historical pistol but you can get away with it a few times but eventually you'll start cracking and breaking parts because it's simply not strong enough to fire it and never never was but it's really an interesting world war one sidearm that's a truly unique design that people don't think about as is this one here, the Beretta 1915. 
like the glycinti, we fire glycinti. But it, in every other way, it's a different gun. And this gun, if nothing else, is very historically important as this was Beretta's first mass-produced handgun. Up to this point, they focused on shotguns and rifles. Now this began as the brainchild of Beretta's chief lead designer, Tulio Morangani, Morangani, who would design many, many guns for a long time, and you'll even see designs from him through the early 1950s until he passed away. What he did, he took this gun here. This is the Spanish Ruby. Now keep in mind, as I said, Italy was already working with Spain to produce Bodios over in Spain, and the Ruby was a simplified version of a Browning design made in Spain by dozens and dozens of small factories. And France would purchase these in large numbers, up to nearly 100,000 in World War I early on, and they would just keep buying them. We don't really know how many rubies were made, but that's a story for another day for a French video. This is my French one. I joke that I bought this because I get to show it off in so many videos. It's a very simple gun. It's a blowback. No bolt hold open. No locked breech. We have a chamber for 7.65 Browning, 32 auto. We have a concealed hammer back here. Single action only. We have a safety on this side that blocks the trigger. This also works as a manual slide hold back for disassembly. Just a simple massive slide, wood grips, nine round detachable mag, holes in it like that. This uses very thick steel components because they weren't sure of the quality of the steel they were going to get in Spain and that went doubly true as World War I progressed and good steel became harder and more expensive. So they overbuilt the tar out of these so they could use different grades of steel. And this would lead to a whole family of guns. Marangani saw that. His nation's standard cartridge was 9 by 19 and he designed this gun here, which is essentially a ruby beefed up a bit to fire 9x19. Whereas 9x19 was a pretty wimpy round to be shooting out of a locked breech gun, it was a little too powerful to shoot out of a direct blowback. So he did a few things to solve this problem. To compare, we have a simple blowback gun here. Barrels protruding here. See? We have a concealed hammer. We've got it back here. Wood grips. I'm going to pull this out and it's going to come forward. Do we have a mag catch in a very similar style to the Ruby? Now, this has the more common magazine with the open slide, so, excuse me, sides, which is extremely iconic of Beretta guns for a long time afterwards, up to the 50s. But the very first mags made for these looked more like ruby mags. They were solid with the, um, with the holes in them, like so. Okay. The early... Keep working on that. We even have a similar safety here. A little more ergonomic, but it does block the trigger, is on the ruby. And it also acts as a bolt hold back, or a slide hold back, I should say. Working too much with rifles lately, guys. Because there's a notch there. And here your mag can come out. Now we're doing this. So it's a little sticky on the bottom. This is actually disassembly here. If you have this held open, you can pull your barrel out. That's it. This locks on a post and then if I were to let this go forward the slide would go whoop and it would just completely disassemble and that's it. So disassembly dirt simple because it's a very simple gun. 
Now, he could not just scale up the ruby for 9x19 glycinti. He had to do a few things. For one, he made this slide very heavy, especially in the rear, to give it more resistance when it's blowing back. Now, he did introduce an early version of what would become the very prototypical Beretta open top slide. If you notice the ejection ports on the top, and we have a bridge here, but there's no bridge in the front. It's all, all the mass is in the middle and the back for recoil. So while this isn't the common Beretta slide yet, we can see where it kind of started. And your front sight's on your barrel. Rear sight's affixed. He also, in addition to beefing up the slide, added a secondary buffer spring which was just comes back and hits keeps that from battering the frame it comes back it gives a cushion at the end so we won't beat our frame up finally he added a second safety here right here it's a little stiff too this is a hammer safety kind of interesting so let's look the trigger safety's off. Nothing happens. Put this. Bloop. Now, interestingly, if you have this on and cock it, see it's on here, it kicks it off. So just if you own one of these, know that when you charge it, if you have that on, it will be toggled off by racking the slide. Otherwise, a very simple design for a trigger system and one that would appear in many later Berettas. It's kind of a single piece design there. This does have a separate extractor and ejector. Whereas some later smaller caliber versions would use the firing pin as an ejector. But that's about all I can say on this gun. As far as this design, it was patented in 1915, hence why it's marked on the side, 1915. It's not really a model number, although in this case it happens to be the same year model, but that's a patent, breathe it. And the military would start to purchase these. They would first buy 5,000, and then 5,000 more, and then 5,000 more, with the final contract happening in late 1918. So the military would acquire about 15,000 of these to supplement the 1910 Glycenti and the 1889 Bodeo, both Type A and Type B. So we've got a lot of guns in service. They also had several 32 caliber guns, 7.65, which we'll get to in a different video since already getting long enough. They would finally do about 670 of these for the commercial private purchase market. Because this was in a proprietary caliber, because this is a pretty heavy gun, it's small, although we do have actually a longer barrel than the Glycenti. It's a heavier gun than the Glycenti. We have a four inch barrel as opposed to th three and three quarters. But because it's a simple blowback, this is just robust steel all around. It's a very de dependable, reliable gun. And that's really where it was better than the Glycenti. It was also cheaper to mass produce, for being simple. But it, it really succeeded where the, nine, uh, excuse me, the Model 1910 failed in pretty much every aspect. And this is why Beretta is a well-known pistol manufacturer till this day. Their first gun was pretty much a hit. I know 15,670 isn't a big production number, but, you know, it was World War I, and that was enough to supplement what they needed. The, the commercial guns would be purchased some by officers in the military, but a lot would be purchased by Italian police who wanted to use the same cartridge, and a very tiny number would be exported from Italy. As with everything else, these would be kept in service through the 20s and 30s, and still some would be in use in 1940 when World War II was going on. So they would not be officially obsolescent until 1945. Just a really interesting gun, and I'm happy to have one. They're, again, they're pretty uncommon to rare. They're not super expensive for as rare as they are, 
but you do not find many of them. They really don't. And I love its place in both World War I and Beretta history. Plus, it's Marangani's first pistol. Well, to wrap things up, we have this model here. And this is actually quite a rare model. I just really stumbled into this one by mistake. This is the 1923. Now, there were several developments in the 32 line, the 1917, the so-called 1919, which is actually a 1922 model, and we'll look at those, as I said in a different video. But we're talking about them because the 1922 introduced this exposed hammer here. We still have a single action only trigger, but now we have an exposed hammer. Whereas before, it was a concealed in the frame and slide. This still fires 9 by 19 glycenti. In fact, it was the last major production gun to fire this cartridge. And this really shows the direction Beretta was going. This was still designed by Marangani. We now have the more traditional Beretta slide. What he basically did is took the bridge away here, just deleted that. And this strap up here with the front sight, which is on the barrel on this one, he moved and made part of the slide. See, it's fully encompassed now. This hammer gives a little more flexibility. And also we got rid of the secondary safety back here. It's no longer necessary or even really possible. We have a very similar safety up here, which doubles as a slide lock. This assembly is similar, but because we have this bridge in the front, now we push this back and pull it back and out. So that catches on the mag there. So if you have your mag in, you just need to push down the follower to let it go. This uses updated, but still interchangeable mags with the 1915, holding eight rounds. The base plates have been simplified a little bit, as has the disassembly method. The grip has been straightened out a bit compared to this. The angle's changed a wee bit. The mag release has been turned into a half circle, whereas this one is more of a slant or an angle. They're both ridged, although this one has coarser ribbing for a better grip. And this has these uh, steel mags, with, oh, excuse me, uh, steel uh, grips, which appear on the military contract guns. They also did wood. The pressed steel grips would first appear on the 32 caliber guns and be carried over to this one. In fact, some of these were even fitted with uh, shoulder stocks. So this was essentially a peacetime, a nicer version, an updated version of the 1915. And it would go into production in Beretta in the 1920s, but they would not make very many. Italy was already getting away from the 9 by 19 Glycenti cartridge. So what, what happened? The Italian military would purchase about 3,000 of these to supplement their existing guns. And in total, Beretta would make about 10,000 to 10,500. Really the largest single contract they had was for Romania. Now, Beretta wasn't completely honest about these guns. In their literature of the day, they said they could fire 9 by 19 Parabellum the same, or at least they led that impression. They did update it a little bit. We have a heavier spring. We also have replaced the steel cushion, the steel recoil buffer with a, a kind of a nylon one, which was more effective. So it is a little more robust than the 1915. But still, it's not a good idea to shoot 9 by 19 Parabellum out of these. Now keep in mind, not all Parabellum loadings are the same. You had the original pistol loadings for Lugers, 
And you, of course, had loadings for later machine guns like the MP18, MP28, and MP40. So certainly machine gun ammo would shatter these guys. Pistol ammo, that was a little lighter loaded, you could probably get away with if you only shot them occasionally, say, for police use. So of the 10,000, 7,000 went to Romania and Italy combined. The rest were sold on the commercial market in Europe and America, and also some in Africa. It's just an interesting gun, and it's really the last production 9x19 Glycenti, as I said. This gun would lead to more 32s. It was a scaled up 1922. It would be scaled back down into the 1931, which would lead into the 1932, which would lead into the 1934, which was chambered for 380, known in Italy as 9mm Corto. So they really weren't going away from 9mm in Italy, they were going away from 9mm Glycenti. They figured out that 380, 9mm Corto, was almost as powerful, and in a defensive role it really didn't matter, and it was so much just less convoluted and allowed the guns to be cheaper and lighter and you know you don't have to worry about people putting the wrong ammo in the guns so that's what would happen by World War II although all of these would still be in service in some capacity or the other during that war get out of there Frenchy or Spanish <laughs> I just thought we'd talk about this I think it's an interesting story of these three guns and the caliber they even made a uh, submachine gun and semi-automatic police carbine called the, um, the M1830 for 9mm Glycenti. So it was, it was standard and common for about 20 years in Italy, but was used very sparingly outside. Well, sorry this was a little longer than I thought, but you know, I enjoyed talking about it. You guys can always pause or have food or bathroom breaks, right? <laughs> Appreciate you sticking with us. If you have any questions or want to talk about your own guns, we really welcome them below. If you like the video, please click. If you haven't already subscribed and like this kind of content, we, we try to vary it up. Long, short, shooting, not shooting videos. Try to do something a little bit for everyone. And we do have a video coming on the 32 series from Beretta. And uh, we'll see where it goes from there. I'm going to pick to hold this one at the end because it's my favorite. <laughs> I just I was really happy to get this uh, 1915. I just lucked into it. I had one years ago and sold it and regretted it and was trying to buy it back off the gentleman and then unfortunately he, he passed away and uh, I didn't want to bug his son, son about it so I found this one and uh, it's a really neat gun I think. I've always been a Beretta fan. <laughs> anyway, appreciate you tuning in. And we'll catch you next time.